morning to you all. Um, can I just say again um, and reiterate with these, these little books, we've, we've bought a little pile of them. They are really, really good. And just to clarify, this is only the book of Genesis. It's quite a fat book, but that's because it's giving you lots of room to take notes there. And uh, if that's something you're interested in, please do come up and see us and get one of these. Uh, five quid is just a little bit less than you can buy it for yourself. It'll be a really helpful thing for you if you want to really just get into uh, the books that we're going through. And that book will last you... I mean, I, the, way, the rate that we go, that's more than a year's worth. Let's, let's be honest. That's going to last you more than a year, five quid for a year. You can take your notes and keep your notes on it, and it will just be a lovely thing to help you. You can also write down all the tricky questions uh, to trap your uh, home group leader with as well uh, as things occur to you during the service. So that's a really helpful thing. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll get into this book. Father, we thank you so much for your word that you are not only a creator God, but you're a speaking God. You didn't just make the universe and then disappear off to do something else. You have made us uh, to know you. You have revealed yourself to us, not just in your creation, but by speaking to us. So help us to listen. Help us to hear when you speak. And bless us, we pray, as you speak to us that we might understand it and apply these things to our hearts. We want to get to know you better, creator God. And so we ask this in the name of your precious son. Amen. Now I have to confess, I cannot remember where it was or who it was from uh, that I heard this illustration, but it has always struck me as being really helpful. Okay, so now imagine that you are lost in the middle of a very large forest, and that as you walk along, <coughs> you reach this crossroad. Okay, there's lots of different directions you could go. You've no idea where you are. Panic is starting to rise. Yeah, you are a lost person. But there's a signpost <coughs> with pointers going for all different directions at this junction that you arrive at. The only problem is some vandals have kicked the signpost down, and there it is just lying at the side of the road. What are you going to do? Well, because you're intelligent, you don't panic at this point. The answer is actually obvious. Some of you will have already clicked this. What do you do? All you need to do is pick up that signpost, find the pointer that, point that, that, that tells you the place you've come from, yeah, and put it back into the hole with the pointer going down the direction you've come from, and then all the other pointers are going to be in the right place, aren't they? Right? It's obvious, really, when, when you say it. That, but if that's just helped you with survival, that's going to save your life one day, then you heard it here first. That's fantastic. But here's the point. It's only when you really know where you've come from that you can know the right way to go forwards. That's why the book of Genesis is so important to us. It tells us about our origins, in actual fact, that's, that's really what the word means, Genesis. It just means origins. It tells us who we are, why the world is the way that it is, why we are the way that we are. And it's only when you know those things, when you've got some clarity on those things, that you'll be equipped to navigate through life wisely and effectively. Now, I've been really looking forward to starting this series because Genesis is such a formative and an important book. So many things come back to even just these first chapters of Genesis. It's really, really important in the way that we think. But I've also been uh, a little bit apprehensive because Genesis, and especially the first 11 chapters of Genesis, they contain a fair bit of material that people tend to divide over and get really feisty about. Uh, doubtless, you're going to have your own opinions, many of you, concerning sort of, you know, aspects of the creation story. So things like time scales that are involved, uh, what happened in the days of Noah, you know, different things like that. And all of those are very important topics. We will, we will look at them a little bit. But what we don't want to do as we go into this series is to fall out in any way over things that are non essential, things that are secondary, not crucial things. 
We want to be as certain as possible about the things that are actually certain in this book. And we want to stand firm on any issues that might undermine the Christian message, the gospel, the message of salvation. That's right, isn't it? Everyone here wants to do that, yes? I hope so. But we also want to be generous towards each other in any matters that lie outside of those things. So as the, apparently it was the German theologian Rupertus Meldenius famous book. Now he's not famous for anything except for saying this, as far as I can, uh, as far as I can tell. He said, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. That's a really helpful little catchphrase, isn't it? In essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. So let's just make sure that truth and love find their, their, their place in our hearts and in our conversations as we go through this series. So I don't know what you're hoping that for me to say in this series. And some of you will be kind of rooting, which way is he going to go? Especially concerning chapter 1. But I'm going to try and avoid any insistence on things that the text isn't actually clear about. I'm not going to insist on them. And I'm going to try and keep the main thing, the main thing. That is, I'm going to try and emphasize, as we go through each part of this book, what the main thing is that the text is talking about. And I'm going to try and get us to really zero in on that without getting too sidetracked into secondary things. I do, by the way, have my opinions about all kinds of things in this book, okay? And, and you might be outraged by some of them. And you're welcome to quiz me on them after the service. That's fine, and we'll do it with love and charity, won't we? Technically, I do actually have a science degree. I'm a Bachelor of Science, but it's not in a field that's in any way relevant to the book of Genesis, so that, that doesn't really help us. And there are plenty of resources that, that I and others can point you to if you want to just scratch around in that secondary issues realm. I will say up front, I do not believe that there's any reason to think that what science tells us ever clashes with what God tells us. No reason to think that. I think science and the Bible are friends. And if you don't think that, I think you've got some issues. I believe that all truth is God's truth, right? And that actually what the sciences do is help us to explore and to discover the wonders of what God has made and how God has made it. But science is limited. The Oxford professor John Lennox illustrates this well. It's a great little illustration he has. He tells an anecdote about a little girl asking her mother why the kettle is boiling. You heard this illustration? Her mother starts talking about all the physics of it all. She's obviously a scientist. The heat from the hob is conducting into the kettle because according to the laws of thermodynamics and according to Flanders and Swan, the heat from the hotter body will pass to the cooler body, right? We know this. This is science. And within the kettle, that heat is going to move through the water in eddies and currents, and, and convection currents are going to happen, and the temperature is going to rise until the water reaches the boiling point of 100 degrees centigrade, because that's science. That's the kind of answer that science gives us to why the kettle's boiling, isn't it? But when the little girl asks her daddy, why is the kettle boiling? He explains, because we're going to make a pot of tea. <laughs> it's very, very different, isn't it? And so Lennox points out that all science can do, really, is give us answers to the how, but not to the why. That's why we need a book like Genesis. Why are we here? Why are things the way that they are? And those are massively important questions, aren't they? And God's word, his revelation to us, starts with Genesis in giving us the answer. Now, I don't know how far we're going to get this morning. Probably not very far at all, because we have, our time is very limited. But we're going to start by trying to discern what are then, what can we say about the non-negotiables in our understanding of this book? What are the things that we're just going to say, no, we're not, we're not, you know, we're on firm ground here. And my approach to this is to give you a short survey as we start out. I hope that you don't find this too dull. A short survey of what the New Testament authors believed. 
This is where having something like this will be useful for you to jot down notes like that. But see, we're going to put them up on the screen. Uh, and then after that, God willing, we, we maybe still have some time to just dip in, dip our toes into Genesis chapter 1. So what did the New Testament authors believe? I mean, that's pretty important, isn't it, to figure that out. How does the New Testament understand the Genesis account? We know we're on firm ground when we look at that, don't we? Now, what I want to say up front here is they believed, and we're going to see this, that the Genesis account is real history, is real history. Let's start with Jesus. I mean, it's not an exhaustive survey, but Matthew 19. Jesus is asked about his views on divorce, and in answering this, Jesus does something very interesting. He takes them back to the foundation of marriage itself. Matthew 19, verse 4, Jesus says, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, in the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So according to Jesus, at the beginning, that is, the beginning of history, He's saying at the beginning of history, God made them male and female. It's a quote from Genesis 1.27. We just had it read to us. And then he quotes straight on on the tail of that, Genesis 2.24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Jesus believed, first of all, and fundamentally, God made us. Jesus believed that. And he quotes Genesis to tell us, How God made us, in what way? Male and female. And then he gives a historic basis then for why God's definition of marriage is a lifelong, one flesh union between male and female. That's God's definition of marriage. I mean, you can define it however you want. But that's how God defines marriage. That's pretty relevant in our current age, isn't it? It's an ordinance, says Jesus, that still stands. And notice here how Jesus, this is quite interesting, he is happy to take Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and just blend them together. Like these things, they follow nicely together. They're they're one one part of one thing. That'll be interesting later as we look at them more closely. Then later, some questioners uh, try to trap Jesus. Some questioners, they trap Jesus, they try to, by asking him if it's right to, to pay taxes to Caesar. This is an interesting story. See, they think that they've got Jesus by coming up to him and asking him this question. Because, well, what's going to happen here? If Jesus says yes, then the Jews are going to dismiss him. You're a collaborator with Rome. We don't really want to listen to you. But if Jesus says no, what are they going to do? They're going to go running to the authority straight away and get Jesus arrested. He's a rebel against Rome. It's an entrapment question. But what does Jesus do? He, he asks them to show him a Roman coin. So they bring him this coin. And Matthew 22 says this, and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And I just love that story. And you're sort of thinking, Jesus has just smashed them, hasn't he, really? It's a brilliant answer. But what's it got to do with Genesis? Think about it. The coin is Caesar's because it bears his image. And we are God's. We belong to him because we bear his image. I mean, that's Genesis 1.26. We just had it read to us. Created in the image of God. Then in Matthew 23, Jesus is addressing the corrupt religious leaders of Israel. Who, and, and he says that they are accountable for the blood of all of God's righteous servants because they killed them rather than heeding their warnings in history. He says in verse 35 of Matthew 23, And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that's been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And you see what's going on there? Jesus believes that Abel... The second son of Adam and Eve, named in Genesis 4, is as historically real as all the other prophets in Israel's history. 
Jesus is treating this as history, isn't he? Matthew chapter 24, Jesus compares his return with what happened in the days of Noah. He says this, it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. And this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. The account of the flood, Jesus believes it. He even gives us detail of what was going on in it, which we don't really get in the Genesis account. He's telling us, look, people were doing all of these different things. He wants to flesh it out. And that account of the flood in which Jesus says all people were swept away except for Noah, Noah and his family, is as real as his return. If that happened, this is going to happen. And in the same way, a total, final judgment, a reshaping of creation as it was then, then it will be when God comes to judge, just not by a flood. And also, Jesus believed, finally, that Satan was a liar from the beginning. This is an interesting thing. It's from John 8. He says this, again, talking to, uh, to the Pharisees. You belong to your father, he says. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. It's strong stuff, isn't it? He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. See, there's no hint that Jesus considered any part of the Genesis account to be anything other than a record of things that really happened. Can you see that from all of these quotes? And the other New Testament writers carry that understanding on as you read through them. They base their theological arguments actually on the historicity of the Genesis account. It's especially true of the Apostle Paul. Let me give you three things that he says, a brief sketch here. First of all, Paul taught that sin and death entered the world through a literal Adam. So Romans chapter 5 says this, Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. He repeats himself in 1 Corinthians 15, says, As By a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. As far as Paul is concerned, Adam is a real figure of history, as real as Jesus. He wants to compare them as two men. And this is really important because it's through Adam, we're told here, Paul insists, that sin and death came into the world. That's going to be pretty crucial. Whatever whatever that death means there, it came because of Adam. Therefore, not before Adam in the world. That's quite important, isn't it? We'll investigate that further. Very important point. But here, you see what's happening? Paul is insisting that the very reason that you and I die is because of the actions of Adam. He has passed death on to all of those descended from him. Because in some way, we all share in that first sin that was committed and we all reap its consequences. But if we're united to Christ, look at what he says. If we're united to Christ, that curse is undone. Just as we're united to Adam, we can be united to Christ. And the curse is undone. Our connection to Adam kills us, but likewise our connection to Jesus Christ brings us back to life. Now, additionally, Paul taught that the creation was put under a curse by God. You can find that in Romans chapter 8, where he says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. It's just as the account in Genesis chapter 3 tells us. We'll get to that in a few weeks' time. Because of their sin, God pronounced a curse on the creation. Pain in childbirth, thorns instead of fruit. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden and and they're they're there to, to toil in a world where everything has been frustrated and isn't working as it should. And where everything waits 
hoping for redemption. And then finally, Paul argues, and this is interesting, about how the church should be ordered and led in 1 Timothy on the basis of the Genesis account. Talking about male leadership in the church, Paul says this in 1 Timothy 2.13, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So do you see what's going on here? Don't worry about the issue itself. But Paul argues here on the basis of a a time order, a temporal order, in which Genesis records what happened. He's treating it like important history that has an order that we need to take notice of. Again, there is no hint that Paul or Peter or Jude, all of whom talk about things in Genesis, consider the Genesis account to be anything other than a record of history. That's how we're going to have to deal with it. That's how we'll have to consider this book all the way through. However, Genesis chapter 1 does seem to be a pretty unique piece of literature. I mean, we just had it read to us. You'll notice, even though it's laid out in your Bible, uh, it's laid out in an in a interesting format on the page, probably. It's got, you know, metered and measured and with little titles and headings. As you read it, you're, you're noticing repetitions, aren't you, and rhythms to it. And scholars have, uh, have observed all kinds, you could spend a whole morning looking at all the different interesting things going on as a piece of literature in this chapter. It's certainly been written in a memorable form. It's, it's almost poetry, but actually it's not quite. It's doubtless a historic account, but it's written in what one scholar calls, and it's probably a helpful way of thinking about it, elevated prose, he calls it. It's, it's something special about the way this chapter's been written. Even as you read through it, you notice there's something going on here. This is, this is written in a very interesting way, different from chapter two, actually, where it starts to just get into sort of a historic, what feels like a more hus- historic account. But it's not a poem, and it's not a hymn, and yet it's, it's some kind of special hybrid of very, very high literature not quite poetry but but majestic anthemic almost not just to the book of genesis but to the bible it's a fitting introduction to the whole of god's revelation and so it starts with its greatest theme we've got a few minutes let's look at some of it in the beginning god Have a look at verse 1 with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So, as we start into this chapter, two things I think that Genesis 1 tells us a huge amount about. One is God and the other is us right? You can't really miss that as you read through it. What is God like as we open this book? The very first verse of the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created everything. That expression, the heavens and the earth, is just simply a a, a literary kind of way of saying all that exists, everything in the heavens and the earth, the universe, we would probably say it, In the beginning, God created the universe. I think it's fair to understand in the beginning to mean the commencement of time and space. The clock starts at that verse. And the clock is started by God, this sovereign creator. That is not to say that nothing existed before the beginning. Oh, this is messing with our heads, isn't it? There had to be a before the beginning when nothing existed except God himself. In fact, the New Testament is full of references to this. Like like when Jesus uh, prays in John 17, listen to how he prays. He says, Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. 
before creation even, there was the creator. That's the first thing we learn about the God of the Bible as we open the cover. Now, the context that this book is written into is the ancient Near East. <clears throat> and we probably, you and I probably don't know huge amounts about the cultures of the ancient Near East. But in the ancient religions, we probably know this, the gods were generally material creations. They were part of creation. So it's no surprise to us to, to learn that you know, the ancients were worshipping the sun and worshipping the moon and worshipping rivers and worshipping the stars. All of these sorts of things are going on. They're worshipping the creation. But here, the first thing, an important thing we learn about the God of the Bible, the God of Genesis, he is uncreated. Uncreated. Now, I, I usually use this illustration when teaching about what we mean when we say that God is, is holy. Holy has the meaning of this idea of being separate, separated out, as being different, as being other. That's the idea behind holiness, the big idea behind it. So picture these two things. First thing, an amoeba that's swimming around in your dirty bathwater. Have you got a picture of that in your head? A blobbly, blobbly thing, yeah, under the microscope? Yep, got that. Then the second thing, picture in your mind, <coughs> a mighty heavenly being, a being that the, God, that, that the Bible calls a seraphim, a burning one, the mightiest of all of God's angels in creation. Got those two things? Amoeba, blubbling along over here. Mighty angel over here, flaming in, in power. Got those in your mind? Which is more like God? Which is more like God? And the answer is, neither of them. That's, that's the point I'm making here. Why? Because they're created. He is the creator. He is uncreated. It's a, it's a bit of a tricky concept to grasp. But it's an important fundamental point about God. He is nothing like anything in all of creation. Shouldn't surprise us in the least that we struggle with concepts like the Trinity. If you've ever tried to understand the Trinity, you, you just can't. He's not like anything else in all of creation. You've got creation, all of matter and energy and time and space over here. That's a creation. But outside of that creation, in a sense, you've got the create, you've got God. He is creator, not creation. We've got to keep remembering that. He's not part of creation. There was nothing in existence then, before the beginning, except God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Then there was the beginning. And in the beginning, God made all that there is, everything. He is first. That's the first point. <clears throat> God is first. But it's also important to understand that, secondly, God needs nothing, nothing outside of himself. So God did not create a universe because he was in some sense lonely or because he was lacking something in any way at all. The Apostle Paul reinforces this point in his day when he's speaking to the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill in Athens. And he informs them of this in Acts chapter 17. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. That's a really important thing to know about God, isn't it? The relationship between mankind and God is all one way. That's what Paul's saying, isn't it? In the sense that we need everything from him. We depend on him, says Paul, even for life and breath. But he... He needs nothing from us in the other direction. 
essential to the self-sufficiency. You know, we use the posh word, the aseity of God, that he needs nothing, that he's fully, fully adequate within himself. He has everything. Essential to that, to be understood, is the concept, actually, of the Trinity, that God is Trinity. But even here, in the first chapter of Genesis, there are hints going on that that is the case. First of all, we have here in verse 2, if you look at it, a reference to the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, I think it says in our Bible translations. The word spirit is the same as the word for wind. This is the wind, the spirit of God, poised for action, the power of God waiting to act. Again, in verse 26, if you look down, you see that God seems to speak within himself, saying, let us make God in our image, in our likeness. Now, it's not conclusive, but it's there. Along with the Hebrew word for God being in the plural, Elohim, there's a suggestion that the creator of the Bible, even here at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, is, is not a digital one. You know what I mean by a digital one? You know, one and zero. It's just a one, one on its own. No, in some sense, he's, beyond our comprehension really, a complex one. There is some sort of plurality going on in God. God is not alone. The New Testament fleshes out, as we saw earlier, that even before the creation of matter, there was within the Godhead love and communication going on. Incidentally, the very two things that we, made in the image of God, intrinsically crave love and community. Those are things that existed before creation, before the beginning. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit knows the mind of the Father and of the Son. And he has all that he needs within himself. Everything sufficient. And then finally, at least for today, God made everything. He made everything. The heavens and the earth, all of it, including you and me. And we'll see next week a lot more about how God created everything. But for now, in these title verses, as we just start the chapter here, we're simply told that all of it was made by him. And there's a few words used in the Hebrew language to express the action of creating or making something. This one used in verse 1 here is the rarest of all of those words. It's, it's got a lovely sound to it. It's the word bara. And it's a word, actually, that's used only about the action of God himself. You and I cannot bara anything. Only God is able to do this. There's a power here in this creative act of God that only God possesses. He creates here in a, in a unique and special way. And it seems to me then, as we come face to face with God, even here in the introductory short sentences of this book, it ought to evoke, evoke a, a, a response from us. Here is the God of the Bible. Here is how he's introduced to us. There is no God like him. From eternity, the uncreated creator, the one who needs nothing, the one who has made everything. How ought we to respond? Well, surely it follows that if God is our creator, and if we need to look to him for everything that we need, well then, actually, uncomfortable though it may be to us, he has the right to do with us as he wills. We depend daily on him for his grace. It's the obvious conclusion. We belong to him. We should bow our hearts, our knees to him just because of who he is. The answer from the throne room of heaven in Revelation chapter 4 
is to say along with all of God's people, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. That is the God of Genesis. I hope you're excited with me to look more and more at him and what he says about us. But we'll stop there just for now.